Folks, we're back. This is Steve Sanchez and Jim Jonas with another episode of Veterans in Politics. Today, we're going to have Clark Bossert. He's, uh, I hope I pronounced his name right. He's a congressional candidate for Nevada's 3rd Congressional District. But before we get to him, Jim. You know, actually, uh, it's been a crazy week and a half. I've pretty much stayed away from politics. Yeah. Just trying to get some uh, other stuff in order. Uh, cell phone companies suck. Which ones? No, T-Mobile. Oh. Yeah. So I guess they won't be sponsoring the show anytime soon. <laughs> But uh, I I, maybe if you don't throw your phone at somebody, that yeah, would right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, I resemble that remark. <laughs> anyway, maybe it, maybe they just got confused on what I said. But anyway, it took me a couple days to figure that out. Uh, just based on that note, I think it's amazing now how, like, Steve, how did we live before cell phones? I have no idea, my friend. <laughs> It's because now I'm like, I, now that my phone is back on and working and everything, everybody's like, where'd you go? You just spit up the face of the earth. Did, I'm did like, you start catching up on all your text messages? <laughs> like, come to Steve's party. Did you get that one? No. You didn't get that one? No. That one's sent? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It, uh, How about at your home, home, cell, home, um, home landline number? Did you get that message? Come to Steve's party? No, because I disconnected my uh, home landline. Rating. No, no, I still have my home landline. I oh, you disconnected the, the voicemail. Yeah, I don't oh, have okay. the the recorder. Oh, because I got tired of hearing it. Oh, wow. But not not from you in particular, just okay. in general. This is a very thick card. Feel this card. Yeah. Feel this card. Yeah, you could probably pick a lock with that thing. Yeah. Well, hopefully it says I won't waffle. At the, uh, I, I know I know lines. you could cut somebody's throat with this. <laughs> <laughs> I know you could do that with this card. Well, you know what? It's probably an expensive card. And look, it a, even has you a know what scanner that means? Because yeah. he's a Republican, that means he's got a lot of money. Probably. Well, I, I just got some new some Carhartt overalls, lots of pockets, plenty of pockets for the the <laughs> lobbyists to stuff the money into. So, oh my God, the lobbyists. <laughs> This is the guy. This is the guy that's running for um, Congress. He's been stuffing the money hey, into pockets from lobbyists. Well, at least he's honest. <laughs> and Not a lot that, of people wear overalls. Hey, at least they know what I'm up to. You no, know, he should have. He should have watched his show last week when when the young lady was talking about cryptocurrency. Right. <laughs> Mister Bossert, tell us about yourself. Did I pronounce that right? It's Bossert. Yeah, yeah Bossert. Bossert. Yep. Tell us about yourself. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's awesome to be with you guys. Um, it's awesome to be with veterans. So I appreciate what you're doing. And um, just kind of elevating the conversation of veterans being involved in politics is great. And so just a little bit about myself is that I'm from Southern California. I grew up at a Navy research base, Ridgecrest, California. Um, and I, you know, I didn't serve in the military, but I've got a huge you know, amount of support for the military because that's just the context in which I grew up. And then I ended up going to Virginia for my undergraduate degree in business and then moving out to Vegas about five years ago. So there's a lot of backstory within there and things that have led me to want to jump into the race at this time. But basically, I've been here for five years. I've worked uh, at UNLV as their machine shop manager for their school of engineering and then also uh, as their budget coordinator for student affairs, kind of in a central finance role for a VP. But so this is my first foray into politics. I'm not a politician. Uh, but I love our country, and I think that if we don't get it right this election cycle, we're going to lose it. All right. Tell us about the, um, the, the huge support you have for veterans. I want to hear about that. Yeah, well, I mean, if you say, hey, I'm going to go give some of, you know, a large chunk of my life to, you know, and put my life on the line, you know, for the sake of freedom, we've got to have your back. Yeah. So even in just business contracts at a much lower level, it's like, hey, if you incur an expense on behalf of the company, you know, we're going to reimburse you. We've got to do so much better for our for our veterans. So I appreciate, I mean, obviously these men and women, they've laid down their lives or at least taken an oath saying, hey, I'm going to defend the Constitution. And if it requires me laying down my life, I will do it. So that's huge. I mean, that's a huge just uh, level of self-sacrifice that, that I appreciate. I don't think it's appreciated enough in general in our country. So, you know, though I haven't served in the military, I've got a huge you know, amount of regard for people that say, this is what I want to give a chunk of my life to. What's your favorite Constitution? Constitutional amendment, yeah. or sorry, or okay. Yeah, the constitutional yeah. amendment. Sorry, maybe it should have been a little bit more specific. Yeah, well, I, obviously, <clears throat> freedom of speech is huge, and the second protects the rest. So, mm -hmm. you know, freedom of speech is, uh, 
you know, it's, it's paramount. If we, if we don't have that, you know, what kind of country do we have? And we really lose a lot of the conversation that holds the rest of our democracy intact. And right now that's something that we're seeing censored all the time. And okay. so I just spoke out of the Clark County commissioners meeting and they oh, had- Which one though? One that they tossed out? Uh, yeah. Mac Miller? Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about that. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was wild. And, uh, you know, actually at that hour, I had stepped out to go get an x-ray for my foot, um, playing hockey accident. And you just story. missed the... Yeah, I missed that one hour, but I was there before and after, and, and mm -hmm. it was pretty wild. And I've been to other meetings, you know, where the police have had to get involved and, you know, remove people by force. But, you know, it's wild because the agenda item, I think it was 96 that I spoke out against, you know, they were saying, hey, if you say anything COVID related that doesn't fit the official government narrative, mm -hmm. we're going to censor you. We're going to call it a, you know, a public health crisis and it's, you know, misinformation. And we're going to criminal criminalize that free speech. So that's super wrong because, you know, I can get into that more. But, uh, you know, free speech is our right. It's our inheritance as Americans. And it's sick that they would try to censor that, especially in a time where nobody knows exactly what's going on. Um, I think there's some things that make a heck of a lot more sense than others, mm -hmm. but we have a right to discuss that. And they're trying to clamp down on that. So, yeah, so, it's so terrible. How long you been involved in Nevada politics? Yeah, I've been involved for about a month. So I just filed. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, aside from voting, aside from voting and loving Good my country. This is not vodka. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I've been involved for a month. So I just filed with the FEC on September 1st. So you, 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 how old are you, Mr. Bossu? Yeah, I'm 29. So you're 29 years old. So for the past, when you become 30? Uh, October 11th. Oh, so it's coming up. Yeah. So for the past uh, uh, 29 years, you haven't been in politics until mm -hmm. about a month ago. Yes, that's true. <laughs> and you want to run for Congress. Yes, sir. All right. Tell us about your foreign policy. Okay. Um, and I could even backtrack a little bit. Um, for, you know, more towards kind of my rationale for running into Congress, or I can jump straight into foreign sure, policy. Let's but let's your rationale you run Yeah, so, so just to dive in, you know, when I was in college in Virginia for my business degree, I'm a Christian, and I felt like uh, there was a seminary professor at that time that spoke in one of my classes, and he said, hey, we're having uh, an internship in Las Vegas with Grace City Church. Mm -hmm. And I felt like at that time, God was saying, you ought to go. And so I, you know, I just went. So I came out, and I moved to D Street in Washington. Uh, if you know where that's oh, at. Oh, wow. Yeah. You and D in Washington. Yeah, I lived on D Street in Washington. What are you doing down there? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I know most, pe most people, when I say that, they're horrified that I lived there. But honestly, I had the time of my life, and God just radically you know, changed the way that I saw the world and changed me. And so I worked with anti-sex trafficking. I worked with homeless outreach and Foster Connect and then after-school programs for kids. Within this 30 days you've been involved in politics, you've done that? No, 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 sorry. This was seven years ago. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, seven okay. years ago. Uh, so, you, you, so you, you've been involved with the, with the community prior to that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's okay. what's led me into it. So seven years ago, I moved out for this internship. I'm okay. working with these communities, and I'm wanting to understand what's going on. Why is, the, why is the cycle of poverty so vicious? Why is it that you have a 94% chance of living in poverty if you grow up in these neighborhoods? And the more that I did this work, I realized these are all policy problems that need to get solved from the top down. And so that's, you know, these failing schools, failing healthcare system, welfare, you know, a lot of this stuff, it just needs, it needs reform right. and it's, it's affecting people's lives and their lives have dignity. So it really made me sick. And it felt like this is one of the justice issues of our time that nobody's going after. And so that's kind of when the seed of being interested in politics was put in my heart. And I actually did two summer internships between my sophomore and junior and junior and senior years. And then when I graduated in 2017, my wife and I, we were just, uh, you know, my guilty pleasure thought was, Did I want to move. Did you mention that in your bio? What's that? Wife. No, I have a wife. Get kids? I have one kid. You didn't mention that either? I know. Well, I <laughs> wanted to save it for you, Steve. Oh, okay. Um, so it's as a surprise, but. <laughs> because a lot of people, they like family. Yeah. You know, you yeah. know a family man or a family woman. If you, yeah. if you enter the race of Congress, they, they like yeah. to know that you won't go astray. Yeah. Well, I won't go to straight. I mean, I've got a lot at stake. So my daughter was just born September 4th. Oh, so I launched on the 1st and then she was born on the 4th. So I've just got enough sleep uh, in this last week to have a coherent oh, so, conversation so, so with you. So you have a, a, a newbie at home just yeah. now. Okay. Yeah, new baby girl. Oh, Virgo. Yeah. So anyways, I love our country. Okay. I want to have a future to pass on to my daughter mm -hmm. and then and to my wife and, and our future kids. And so as I was working on these problems, I just realized 
I want to move to Vegas. I want to continue working on this. And so, you know, I moved out and I just volunteered with every free bit of time I had. And you've been in Vegas seven years? Uh, five years full time. Okay. Yeah, seven years starting in college, five years moving out here full time. Mm-hmm. And so I worked at UNLV, worked as an engineer, worked in central finance. Mm-hmm. And then just every free moment we had, we were on the strip on Fremont, um, just, you know, working with a, a ton of different ministries and food banks, homeless outreach, and just things that help bless the community because I wanted to see it transformed. Mm-hmm. And Vegas has a ton of potential, but, you know, the problems that we're facing are not super hard to solve. They're just hard to solve if you're already in 10 different people's pockets. So let me ask you this question real quick. So yeah. you're running for uh, CD3. Mm-hmm. So you lived on Washington in D. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's actually CD1. Yep. So where do you reside right now? I know federal law states yeah. that you don't have to live in your district to run in that congressional district. Yeah. But why not run for CD1? Well, I live in CD3, so that's why. Oh, okay. And so you, you should, actually I mean, live in your district. So you're not Danny Tarkanian. That's, no. That's good to know. And I mean, seriously, listen, if you're a politician that you think that you have... Or any, Dina Titus. Yeah. Or, or Stephen Horsford. <laughs> yeah. And, well, crap. He, he lives all the way in Washington with right. the wife and kids. It's not like he's he's actually living there. No. Yeah. That's another story. Yeah, so I'm right on... Uh, like the 215 in Eastern, Silverado Ranch, right at the heart of CD3. Yeah. And I think, I mean, why would you move? If you're such a great politician, you should be able to be competitive in any blue or red district. So I think that as a Republican, we can win on policy alone if we serve people well enough with communication. And all communication is service. So um, <clears throat> right to Congress, huh? Yeah. No, no city council, yeah. no assembly. Yeah. Right to Congress. Yeah. Why? Good question. So I'll say that I would, you know, first of all, I would be happy to serve God wherever he wants me to go. So what I'm doing here has maybe more notoriety. It's in the public eye. It might seem more exciting. But the truth is, is that it's not more significant than the mother, the mother raising the kids, the child trying to get the, the grade, the guy trying to run the business. So all that matters is responding to what you feel like the right thing for you to do is. And so when I was looking at this race, I just, you know, was looking at, you know, what should I jump into city council? And I'm not above serving in in any of those places because they're all they all really need great people to go into them that love freedom. But I looked at CD3. It's a top five must win district for Republicans and Democrats. And as you remember, Nevada was a battleground state. Vegas was a battleground city. And then CD3 is a battleground, you know, one of the most battleground districts in our country. And so I thought, you know, everyone wants to be excited to vote for somebody awesome that they love. It's going to be incredible. And, you know, I was like, hey, we have to win CD3. Who's the front runner? So I went and met with, you know, a lady that's right now the Republican front runner that rolled over a state legislature. Um, Who's that? April Becker. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she's nice, seems like a very decent Nevadan, and I don't have anything against her. But, you know, I was, when I was with her, she, uh, she said something to the effect of, um, hey, Clark, and this is long before I was running. I wasn't a competitor. But, uh, you know, I was considering supporting her and she just basically in conversation said, you know, hey, I am there's nothing that I can do when I get to Washington except for be a brick in the wall trying to stop the socialist agenda. And I didn't say this at the time, but I felt like that's not good enough. There's always more that you can do. You don't need to wait 10 years for a committee assignment. You can do you can do whatever you can with your platform at the time to elevate conversations and fight for freedom. So I was like, first of all, I don't think this is a winning combination. Second of all. I don't really agree with, you know, even what's what's happening here. And, you know, she'll openly admit, you know, she, so she's running against Susie Lee, who's a Democrat incumbent. And in interviews, she'll openly admit, hey, I've known Susie for 20 years. We've been friends. And now suddenly she's claiming to be substantively different. And she wants to represent us. And, you know, I have nothing against her personally. It but sounds like the governor's race. But I, I don't I don't trust it. I don't trust it. That's all. OK. And it's a winnable district. It's plus one Republican last in 2020. And then I think it's gotten even more red since then. And how you plan to get the um, the independents and the libertarians on your side? Yeah. Well, I've even got a plan for getting Democrats on my side. So, oh, let's hear it. Um, I, you know, like I said earlier, I think if we just talk to people about issues that are important, then, you know, what I was telling Jim before the show started is that you know, the beauty of America is that if we talk about something and I'm a politician and, and you disagree with me, there's no political consequence for you, which is beautiful. But I bet you 
if we talk, we'll probably agree on seven out of 10 issues. So for instance, you know, even to the you know, independents or Democrats or the left, if I were to say, hey, who doesn't want a free economic system that rewards people for the fruit of their labor? Who doesn't want that, right? That's capitalism. You know, capitalism most efficiently allocates capital resources to the best ideas and not to the worst ideas in our country. So, but I think that when politicians are lazy and they're like, oh, I'm pro-God, two-way, you know, freedom, and a capitalist, it, it, it offends people and they're not taking the time to get in the trenches and say, hey, this is, this is the rationale behind you know, why I'm saying these things. So for instance, I was talking to a girl uh, named Leah outside of Tractor Supply and Enterprise and I was there to get a water tank. I was not fit to be campaigning, but we were just talking about issues that were important to both of us. And you know, she's a Obama supporter, DACA immigrant, 21 year old Hispanic woman. And we had a great conversation. And then at the end of it, I said, hey, you know, coincidentally, She's old. Sorry about the mic. All right. You got excited. <laughs> I, I am excited. And I said, coincidentally, I'm actually running for office here in Nevada. And she cut me off to say, Clark, I would love to volunteer for you as a Republican. And I was like, <laughs> I'm still waiting for the hard part. <laughs> so I think that's some of the sentiment is that the left has positioned themselves so far radically left that they're in an indefensible place. I mean, who's honestly going to say, I want to go head to head with Clark and talk about communism and socialism? I'm like, who's really honestly going to do that? What's your religious yeah. background, Clark? Yeah. Um, well, I'll. some people guess by the way that I look. Um, but I'm actually That's just... That's why I'm just asking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The yeah. clean-cut hair, yeah. everything else. So I'm a Christian. So, um, okay. yeah, I... Uh, You're not Mormon? No, I look super Mormon. So, yeah. yeah, I love the Mormon community. I definitely am not a Mormon, and I've mm -hmm. got huge theological differences. But um, I overlap. A lot of the values that they have, we overlap, you know, pro-life and okay. freedom and a lot of other things. So I think there's a huge amount of overlap in terms of what's important in terms of policy. But yeah, I, I got saved in high school. I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, and and that's that's who I am. So you're Catholic? I'm not Catholic, my, my father's Catholic, but I just- I would say I'm just middle of the road, kind so, of non-denominational. So you're non-denominational. Yeah, non-denominational, Calvary Chapel, kind of, you know, middle of the road. Okay. Uh, went to a Baptist college. So what's your foreign policy? Since you're running for a federal seat. Okay, so yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad you uh, brought that up because I wanted to kind of, uh, not to cut Steve off, but mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of uh, define it uh, a little bit more on what's, what do you think the role of Congress is? You, you uh, stated prior that uh, you're a very strong supporter of veterans, and, mm -hmm. and so am I. Um, but... There's always this battle back and forth between the role of Congress versus the executive branch as far mm -hmm. as uh, whether or not to declare war, military conflict, yeah. things of those nature, uh, of that nature. But your your foreign policy is important because our, if you want to engage in military conflict, mm -hmm. what are you going to do to support the vets when they come back? Yeah. Because I think there's a, th there's a tremendous gap there mm -hmm. that neither party has gotten right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what do you think the role of Congress is as far as military conflict? Well, I think the role of government to go just one step farther back is that the role, the, the proper function of government at its core is to preserve our God-given rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's it. I don't need to tell you what hat to wear. I just need to, make, need to make sure that your life isn't being taken, killed in the streets, your stuff's not being taken, nobody else's freedom is encroaching on yours. So that's what I think, you know, I, I believe in a lot of freedom and freedom necessarily requires individual self-government and personal responsibility. And so I think, I, I believe in small government and I want to see, you know, free America. But as far as being involved in, in foreign conflicts, I don't think it's our job to police the world. I don't think that that's what the Constitution enumerates as, you know, the role of, uh, of our government. And I think that, you know, the Constitution is free and available for download anywhere around the world on the Internet. And it's, I think that some of the sentiment of the founders was to say, hey, this is, we're trying to start a new experiment of freedom. We're not going to have a theocracy, we're not gonna have a dictatorship. We're gonna try this grand experiment of freedom. And we wanna be kind of a light on the hill to the world. Not that we're better, but we're saying, hey, we're trying something new and I hope it's inspirational to the rest of the world. But we've gotten involved in so many ridiculous conflicts and you know, it's tough because 
you look at World War II, and I, I grew up watching History Channel, and I, I, uh, I loved military history, and that was one of the most no-brainer kind of conflicts. It's like, hey, we are going, like, we're going to defeat evil. We're going to kill the Nazis and to, you know, liberate Europe. And people that were 16 and 17 were, you know, lying and trying to sign up just so they could ship out and that they could go and they could fight. And it was like, obviously, there's so much vision for this fight. And then we've descended into these fights where you're like, I don't really know why I'm here. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if this is worth it. And, you know, we had Vietnam. Then we've had the whole Middle East engagement. And then a lot of it has turned into nation building. And it's, we've really come to a place socially in our, in our society where there's a crisis of worldview and our, and our leaders have a broken worldview. They think that terrorism is happening in Afghanistan because they don't have, you know, the Afghan people and the people in the Middle East don't have enough access to economic opportunity. Therefore, their only outlet is to be involved in terrorism. And I'm like, that's not true. That's not the reason why these things are taking place. They're taking place because of, in large part, their religious beliefs that lead into a worldview. So you get your culture from your values. You get your values um, from your beliefs, and you get your beliefs typically from a holy book or whatever else you have in your society. That's, you know, that's how it flows. And so, anyways, we've gotten entangled in this. We're building nations. We're leaving equipment. Ridiculous Afghanistan withdrawal, which is such a tragedy, literally, of human life and, uh, you know, of the dignity of the Afghan people and just a slap in the face to Americans who've sacrificed so much over the last 20 years. That's a whole other conversation. But I guess maybe to sum it up, I don't think that we should be policing the world. I think that we should be saying, hey, we've got to look after America here. Not that us as people are better. Everybody has dignity, but there are some cultures and governmental structures that best support, um, you know, humanity. And I think that we function best under freedom and not under dictatorship. So feel free to dig in further if that doesn't answer your question. Actually, since I interrupted, Steve, continue. You, Sorry, you know, Steve. Oh, no worries. You know, um, <clears throat> You, you say that we can't police the world, and, and, and I understand what you mean by that. But at the same time, if something is going on in Korea, let's say, mm -hmm. and, 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 or something's going on with China and they're attacking yeah. Taiwan, right, yeah. or North is attacking South or vice versa, yeah. um, don't you think that affects America, especially when you're dealing with... Um, the stock market, uh -huh. don't you think economically it would also affect America? That's why we have to stabilize the world, so to speak. And in and, and, and that respect, that some people might use it as police in the world. Because if you don't yeah. stabilize what's going on in the world, the, market's the market gonna, is yeah. going to crash. Yeah. The economy is going to be all screwed up. Yeah. So what would you say to that? Yeah, well, as far as, you know, foreign interventions, I do support standing with our allies, obviously Israel and Australia and other, you know, Western democracies and folks that have, that have been our allies for a long time, I think that we ought to stand with them. Uh, you know, in foreign conflict, if, if that's what it takes, I don't believe in just intervening, trying to change parts of the world at a whim. Um, but I do think that we should be loyal. It's, it's terrible because what Biden's done in Afghanistan is saying, hey, world, we are unreliable abroad. Don't rely on us. And that's terrible. Um, as far as the markets go, we live in a super, super, let me, go ahead. Let me, let me stop you right there about the, uh, well, Afghanistan, because I, 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 I did a piece on it. Yeah. So what do you know that happened in Afghanistan? What do you know with the evacuation? What, what does Clark Bossert <laughs> yeah. actually know? Well, I'll tell you, everything that I know is not from me being boots on the ground. I'm you know, within two degrees of connection of folks that are boots on the ground there. And there's a lot that's still unknown. Generally, my perception is that the, the outcome that's happened in Afghanistan has been the intended outcome. I don't think it's an accident because we're not that sloppy. You know, the FBI knows and the CIA knows every phone call I'm making. I feel bad for whatever NSA agent is having to watch all the pictures that I'm taking of my baby at home and listen to all my phone calls. I'm like, hey, sorry, bro. I know that you're just an intern, you know, 20 years old, just trying to get a job. But, you know, they know everything. We've got awesome intelligence. And, you know, this was, I think this was the intended outcome. This is not rock science. They could have figured this out. Like, they had plenty of warnings that, 
the Taliban army, they're not ready to hold Afghanistan. And, you know, we just left all of this equipment. And you look at how swiftly China moved in, that the Taliban said, hey, the primary partner that we have in rebuilding Afghanistan and rebuilding our country is China. It's like, look at how quickly this all happened and flowed together. And there's plenty of incentive all over the place. I think that Joe Biden has been in China's pocket for a long time uh, with him and his family. And, you know, if you, ha if you did something and had this, this result, this terrible result, and you were already furnished with the information that the Biden administration was furnished with, this would be what's considered criminal negligence in any other circumstance. If there was a catastrophe about to happen and I was in charge of the police force and I didn't do anything, that's on me. You know, there'd be probably criminal charges for that. You know, it's a dereliction of duty. So as far as what I know happened, orders were given, we withdrew, it wasn't great. Tons of equipment was handed over to the Taliban, still functional. The Taliban are ruling Afghanistan right now and there's still probably about a thousand Americans or green card holders or people that are, you know, were allies to America in Afghanistan that private parties are trying to get out and what I'm get out of the country and what I'm hearing is that the State Department is not allowing for instance flights full of Americans to land in the United Arab Emirates and I mean it, it's sick what's going on and of course my experience is not firsthand but I've got friends with um, a missions organization just a Christian's missions organization they're getting people out and so that's kind of some direct direct info that I have but uh, I mean if you have a further question on that, you know, I'm not in the military, but that's what I've seen happen. That's kind of my take on it. Okay. You're going to talk about your foreign policy. OK, yeah. So in regard to markets, we're super globally integrated mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, of course, there's you know, domestic policy that we need to look after. And as far as the markets go, it's tough. That's a, I'm happy to talk is, you know, as in depth about that as you want. But you know, yeah, we've got a super integrated global supply chain. We've got the Chinese that are holders of massive amounts of sovereign debt from America, you know, and corporate bonds. And, you know, we're getting to a place where because of the Fed's, you know, printing of money, we've just 35% of all dollars in circulation globally were printed in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, hey, there's no inflation. There's not going to be inflation. And already we have double digit inflation. We're probably going to have 20% inflation year over year. And the Fed is saying, oh, we have tools to control it. But you need to understand the job of the Fed is not is, is to maintain calm in the market. So even right before 2008, they're like, oh, it's going to be fine. There's nothing going on here. It's OK. Keep buying. And even now they're saying we've got tools to address inflation. It's running a little hotter than expected. And I mean, people need to know they have no tools. They have no tools to address inflation. They're going to bluff like they're going to fight. And it's going to be if they were even to try to fight inflation, raise rates, they would get knocked out in one punch. And so they're in a tight spot right now where you can either crash the currency or you can crash the markets and they're going to choose to crash the currency. Yeah. And we're already seeing that. And in June, they were talking about, you know, a DUSD or a Fed coin, a stable coin, digital US dollar. So they're already preparing for this. And, you know, not as a, a conspiracy theory, but just as a, um, I'll say a spoiler alert, is that the same crap that happened in Afghanistan you know, the administration that's responsible for that are the same ones that are going to bring you the awesome coming financial crisis. And I don't want to be doom and gloom, but, you, you know, you can change policy, but it's very hard to unspend money. Okay. You know, um, we, we've been involved in the um, judicial system for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And um, um, especially in the, um, the family court division, there's a, there's a lot of um, judges that ignore federal or state or even their judicial canons. <clears throat> as, a, uh, as a representative of Congress, um, how could you um, put together some type of uh, bill that, that, would, that would really, because this is going, to, going on across the country, mm -hmm. how could you put together a, a bill that would really hold judges accountable to the bench? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's a little bit more in the judicial department side of our country. So we've got the executive, legislative, and judicial. Yeah, but, but Congress, and I'm not trying, makes, I'm, Congress yeah. makes the laws. And I'm not trying. I'm not trying to weasel out and say I can't do anything. Um, there's a lot of mandatory minimums that aren't enforced, and there's just a lot of you know corruption in general. Trump did a lot to put judges in places and try to remake the judiciary in large part. I'm not talking about the federal seats. I'm just talking okay. about the, the like state. Local, are you talking yeah, about yeah. local like yeah, family I'm, courts? Yeah, I'm talking about a, a, a federal law that, yeah. that would hold um, 
um, judges accountable when they when they uh, violate the law. Okay, so you're saying like judges that this is what the law states, and they're using their um, uh, not prosecutorial discretion. The discretion. But, okay. Yeah. To and not, they're violating the law. So, yeah. So on, on a federal standpoint, how could you? How could our government hold because of the state regulators are not doing their job? Yeah. Judicial Discipline Commission, um, um, Nevada Attorney General's office, they're not doing. Yeah. Their job. So, so if if there's a federal law that holds judges accountable, then then the U.S. Attorney's office will get involved. Mm -hmm. The FBI will get involved. So what I'm saying is, what type of um, 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 laws that, the, on a federal standpoint, could could hold judges accountable for their misdeeds while on or off the bench? When you say off the bench, are you saying in like retirement? Like they decided to, the, to, to commit perjury or bankruptcy fraud or mortgage fraud or yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll try to answer your question the best I can. I don't have a specific, you know, law or vision in mind that would that would address it and be a silver bullet to fix that corruption. But you've never been involved in family court. No, I know that in family court. Have I, you I never, ever been involved in. I've never been to court for anything. Nothing. Nothing. No friends. I got a ticket. Uh, speeding ticket. No. no, no, no. Yeah, speeding ticket in Lynchburg. No friends. No friends. No no. Relatives. No, I mean, I've had friend. I've had relatives that have obviously been in court for a couple things, but um, I was not you know, in the courtroom with them or closely related to the situation. So I know that in family court here in Clark County, just what I've heard from a friend of mine that is having trouble with, you know, custody issues with his kid is that they, I think, are tending to give uh, preference to, or they're, they're, they're doing what they can in, in the court system to suck money out of whatever party is richer among the two parents. Oh. And So you are familiar with it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe a little bit. And I, I thought that was terrible. So I sat down for about an hour with a, with a friend of mine that's in this situation. And it was awful that they're not looking after the most vulnerable and the weak and the most unable to protect themselves among us being, you know, our children and our society. And it's sick that they're saying, all right, how can we get the most money out of this? How can we drag it out? How can we give <laughs> the, you know, we're going to give the worst parent the most rights so that the rich parent and the better parent will fight in court. Man, I thought keep... I was the only one saying that. <laughs> hey, well, hey. So if you've experienced or if you, you know, are familiar with that, that's, that's what I've seen. And I think that that's terrible. And I also think that because I've worked with anti-sex trafficking, you know, Foster Connect and, and other things, uh, you know, courts are not, I wish they were harder on sex trafficking and they're not. So this is, this is a true story. I literally was on D Street in Washington during my internship, and there was a uh, there was a girl, you know, outside in that neighborhood, and just based on her description, she did not fit in that neighborhood. Ten o'clock at night, we like driven, you. yeah, like me, yeah, <laughs> we'd driven home on the bus, and uh, I was like, I feel like this girl is getting trafficked, you know, this is what's plain to me, and so I was like, hey, I got one of the other girls that was an intern. Just so it's not weird. And I went over, I said, hey, will you go with me? I just want to see if this girl to say, hey, are you okay? Do you need help? Would you like us to try to help you in any way? And we're just like, you know, about a block or two away. We walk down there. This girl is standing out there and she she's speechless. She won't talk to us. She's just shaking her head and she's like petrified. And I'm like, she's definitely getting traffic. She's in front of a house, you know, rough situation. And then I just got the sense of like, I need to get out of here. So Anyways, we, we left after about, you know, talking to her for a minute. And then all of a sudden this truck pulls out, starts chasing my friend Candace and I. And I'm like, Candace, run. And we cross the street, we run, we get back inside the base and we're safe. But I then called the police and I said, hey, there's inside a... Inside the base? It's the Youth With a Mission base. It's oh. just like a, like a charity organization oh. kind of... It's where we were staying. It's where yes. they had housing. So I called the police and I said, hey, there's a girl here and she's, uh, I definitely think she's being trafficked. And they're like, well, do you know for sure? And I'm like, well, when I asked her, she, you know, gave a little nod of the head. And they're like, well, unless you're seeing the act take place, we can't come and get her. And I'm like, what the hell are we doing here? Like, what are we doing? Why can't you come? Just send an officer over. There's plenty of officers. Like, you don't care about people being trafficked. This is a justice issue of our time that nobody cares about. They don't care about the unborn. They don't care about sex trafficking. They don't care about kids going to failing schools. They don't care about minority communities being you know, impoverished and used every four years for a vote. 
and it makes me sick. So it's just, I want to see the, uh, the judges here, you know, have harsher penalties. Like, I mean, seriously, like if you get caught with somebody, I hope it's your life. If you get caught trafficking somebody and that's harsh, but seriously, you know, the, the trauma, it's so hard to undo sexual trauma and the brokenness that occurs when you endure that kind of abuse. You know, <clears throat> there's a lot of um, Congress folks sit on different boards. Mm -hmm. um, what boards do you have in mind that you probably would want to sit on that would best utilize your skill set? Um, I mean, a lot of it, you don't have a choice. Like I said, people show up and they right. brown nose to try to get a decent committee assignment. Right. So, um, you know, I love Congress that it has... Uh, you know, influence on the budget. And so neither party is serious about the budget at all. And that's been true for a long time. And yeah, actually, it, it just not, not to cut you off, but now I actually have a theory on that. I was uh, a couple days ago, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, very staunch Democrat. We've been friends forever, and that's fine. And I'm a registered Republican. And I said, well, Republicans and Democrats are actually pretty much the same. Entrenched Republicans and Democrats. Maybe fiscally conservative at best. I said the only it. difference is is that Republicans um, spend and rip off taxpayer dollars for their projects, what they consider important. Democrats do it for theirs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I said, so there's really not that much of a difference. Yeah. This is why we're not seeing change in our country. Um, is because we just elect people that they have no con they have no concept of what servant leadership is. That's the only type of leadership, regardless regardless of what any kind of MBA program will tell you. There's only one. And you know, on the ladder of success, as you're climbing up it, there is no rung that's the self service rung. It starts out with serving people, and then serving people, and then serving more people. That's what it is to be a leader. And if you don't understand that, you're not fit to be leading on the world stage at this time. So I, I take it you believe in term limits for Congress and, and <laughs> That's Senate. exactly where I was gonna yeah. go. Yeah, I, I believe in term limits. Listen, if you're there and you're, not, and you're not doing a profound amount of good, you ought to get out. And it takes on average 12 years for people to go from winning their first elected office to being president. I think that's true. Maybe it's more or less by a few, maybe more by two. Um, Why do you say that? Just historically, you know, yeah. people that have become president usually uh, won their first presidential election within 12 years of winning their first election to public office. So what, what would you tell Donald Trump? Good for you for winning. Um, <laughs> what would I tell him? He'd never been in politics before. Yeah, which was awesome. He's not a politician. I love it. Well, actually, he has, but yeah. not in elected capacity. <laughs> yeah. So I don't... Yeah, I don't think that it's a necessary prerequisite to go through, you know, to rise up through the ranks. I think it's awesome that he just came in from the side. Yeah. You know, good for him. O o o o um, Obama was what? A uh, state legislator yeah. for... County planner or something. Four years and, yeah. and a U.S. senator for two and then became yeah. president. So, yeah, I say that to say that the 12 year kind of thing, if you... Let's get, not talk about Joe Biden. Yeah. Just been 50 years... Yeah. Never held a job in his life outside yeah. of government um, or, or elected. Yeah. Um, oh, it was Congress, Senate, president, or vice president, president. Yeah. You know, and doesn't know what it's like to write a check or, yeah. or be an entrepreneur or, or yeah. live in the real world. Yeah, basically. Exactly. And that's why I say with the 12 years type of thing, if you get into Congress or, or to the Senate or any, to any other position, you should get to where you want to go, make the changes you want to cha make, make the changes that you want, and then get out. And if you get in, you try, and you're not effective, you should have the humility to say, I'm not the one to champion this fight. I need to leave. Rather than Joe Biden, who's sat in there for 50 years, or however, he's long, however long he's been in politics, and you know, just waffled on everything, and just done what he's had to do to survive and be a political creature that, you know, Flip flops to whatever side is most convenient. I mean, it's you can play before and after clips of him contradicting himself. You know, it takes uh, a, a stern person to um, whoever, whatever person that believes in their conviction. Let's say, yeah. 
let's say you don't want to vote on a bill because it has pork in there because yeah. it's the, the bill is supposed to be for let's say um um guns mm -hmm. and somebody threw in something that even has nothing to do with it yeah. and 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 they push that in the bill right mm -hmm. let's say they push some kind of infrastructure for a congressman in maine maybe. yeah <clears throat> so they pressure in you and they're pressuring you to yeah. vote for this bill and 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 have you been to dc yeah i was just there for september 11th for an event have you have you met with Congress, mm -hmm. senators over there in D.C.? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm connected with Madison Cawthorn. Okay. So, um, and then Josh Hawley is another person that I really like quite a bit. And then How Trey about Gowdy. lobbyists? Because lobbyists are the ones that actually run this country, believe it or yeah, not. Yeah, that's true. Have you met with lobbyists? No, I haven't met with any lobbyists. All right, so you, 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 have, you, have, you have colleagues from, from Congress pushing you to vote. Yeah. You have lobbies blowing up your phone, yeah. pushing you to vote. You might even have a few senators that are pushing you to vote. Yeah. You might have constituents in, in CD3 pushing you to vote. Yeah. But, but your heart says not to do it. Yeah. What are you going to do? Well, I would start by running on the convictions of my heart and presenting that before the constituents of CD3 and saying, hey, if this fits, if this is something that you like, I would love to represent you. If I'm not the guy that you like, that's fine. I think I probably am, and I think I probably am a good fit for CD3. Mm -hmm. So it's my job, you know, to be a representative for the people of CD3 so that they have a real representation in Washington. And so I need to be responsive to them uh, and to nobody else. And exactly how it happens, when you get to DC, Kevin or Nancy comes up to you and they're like, hey, congrats on your race. You know, awesome job, Steve. So glad that you won, huge victory. And we're so glad you're here because we just know that you're a team player and we're ready to work with you. And we've got a crucial vote coming up on a bill tomorrow morning. It's 2,000 pages thick. <laughs> and we just got it delivered to your interns last night. But uh, they're going to read through it. It's fine. And just vote with the pack because we've already all read it. And it's, it's really good stuff. And um, we just know you're a team player and you're going to support us. You're going to come through with a vote that we need mm -hmm. to pass crucial legislation. And we threw $50,000 in there for your district just to, just to throw some crumbs at the peasants so you can have a win on day one for your people. And uh, looking forward to you voting for us you tomorrow. You sure you've never served in Congress? <laughs> no. <laughs> but so that's that's like what conversation was he listening yeah. to? Yeah. That's that's, that you sound pretty familiar pretty well how versed. this works. Yeah. That's exactly how it works. I mean, I don't... I, I mean, that's just what's obvious to me, is that you go in and the, the three ways you get sidelined into being a swampy, irrelevant creature is <laughs> if you care too much about money... If you care about re-election, well, let me stop you right there about money. You know, yeah, yeah. There, there, there's a, since you're a religious man, right? Yeah. So there's a biblical term, mm -hmm. and it says the love of money is the root to all evil. Do you believe yeah. in that? Of course I do. Okay. Yeah. Please continue. Yeah. Because so, money is supposed to use for necessity. Money is not evil in and of itself. So a lot of people no. in the Bible were fabulously wealthy: Abraham, David, Solomon. All of these people had tons of wealth and they used it to promote righteousness in their country or just in their time with their right. people. So, but it does, you know, you can serve God or you can serve money. And uh, even Tom Petty, I think it was him, he's like, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to serve somebody. And, you know, if you care too much about you money. You have one master, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seriously, and that's why I say, I don't know how people can stay loyal in the midst of, hey, here's $100 million to line your pockets. But what is that in the scheme of eternity when I've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of lives that I could affect and all of their have lives. Have you had money thrown at you before? Um, yes, I have, yeah. If I were to drop out right now, I could line my pocket. Kid you not. Mm. So I've already gotten quite a bit of nasty grams from Republican Party operatives. And what, 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 what does it say? Other folks, they're just like, how dare you run? How dare you? And it's absurd that you're running. And I responded, I was like, hey, it's not absurd that I'm running. I get that I'm not your pre-selected District 3 candidate pick and that me jumping into this race has been a giant wrench in your plan for this district. But um, I'm not backing down. And it's the right and the privilege of every American to be offered? in. Um, I, I mean, I wasn't offered any dollar amount specifically, but the conversation, the starting point of the conversation was, hey, if you would like, this is where we could go if it benefits you. And I said, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not for sale. I'm not going to back down. This is what I feel called to do. You know, I love what I do. I love engineering. 
I've, you know, I stepped away from a great job to make zero dollars running a campaign. And um, I'm not independently wealthy. My wife is a nurse at Centennial Hills Hospital. She's probably going to lose her job because of the mandate. Centennial doesn't have a mandate right now, but there's a good chance, you know, they might by the time she's off maternity leave because of our baby. So, I mean, this is right up by me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is costing us financially. I drive a 2012 Camry. And if you see me drive something different, feel free to ask some some more questions. Um, You know, if I've got a new uh, matte black Rolls Royce Phantom 2. But (laughs) you're like, hey, I think Clark is double dealing. But seriously, if you care too much about money, re-election... Um, and if you have skeletons in your closet, that's how they leverage you into being an ineffective swamp creature. And they're like, we've got him. We've got him. And, you know, I'm only going to be alive for 60 more years. And as a Christian, you know, what is that in the scheme of eternity? What's a couple hundred million dollars? And I really want to serve the people of Las Vegas because, you know, there's just terrible things happening. And there's certain conversations that are not taking place at the national level that need to, which is part of why I want to run for Congress and not just like a city council seat. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I seriously love our country and it's just, we're losing it. It's falling apart and we're, it's just being thrown out, thrown down the drain. So I guess the, well, I always say this every show. This is my last question. <laughs> and I got like eight more. Yeah. He can't but, count. He failed yeah, math. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it sucks. I used to actually be good at math. <laughs> Must be wearing off from the seat. You, you, could, no, run, you could run for Congress. I mean, <laughs> you, you might do pretty good. Um, yeah, you I ran don't know. for assembly once. Yeah, and we, we talked about it. It, 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 sound, it sounds like $3.5 trillion, but it's not going to cost anything. Right. That's how it sounds. So, okay, so one of the things when you were talking about living on Washington and D Street. Yeah. So, it, it, it it's something that, like, just frustrates me, um, and maybe you can. I just want your general mm-hmm. philosophy on mm-hmm. it. There's, there's no silver bullet that's going to cure it or anything like that. Yeah. Um. So one of the things that I found interesting over the years is that um, you were talking about basically the I'm basically the way I, I would sum it up is that how. Um, Democrats have patronized Mm -hmm. minority communities in order to get votes. Yeah. Well, now I find it interesting that um, I I call it white guilt, Mm -hmm. white liberals. Not all, but but a lot do the same thing because they're so terrified of like, I'll, uh, I'll just. I'll I'll go after President uh, Biden on this. Mm -hmm. Um, I try not to pick on the president too much because we all have different things. You want to have regard for the office. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, um, well, he has made some very uh, racist statements uh, throughout the years. Yeah. Uh, Talking about, I'll just give one example, talking about how he didn't want his children going to integrated school districts because black people are like roaches and once you allow one in then they they infest the entire community and now and now all of a sudden he's this huge champion of the black community and people like, always forget this stuff goes just on just to fit their narrative yeah. this stuff goes on and on and on and like i'm i'm just using president Biden as an example, because yeah. he's our chief, you know, he's a CEO of our country. But I find it, I, I see it all the time in uh, dealings with people that you used to deal with in the past, I won't deal with anymore. Like I tell people all the time, like, if you want to see true racism, mm-hmm. go to a cocktail party sometime with all white liberals Mm -hmm. yeah you will hear the n-word more times than you will ever hear on any stand-up black comedian show yeah i mean and but then two days later i'll see him on tv pandering pandering and it's like it it, like i don't understand why people don't get that 
Oh, the, but the, how yeah. specifically are you going to be able to win win these people over, though? Yeah, because they're the ones who are going to have to vote for you. Yeah. Well, the solution, the silver bullet solution to racism in our country, um, is radical humility, radical repentance, and radical forgiveness. We need all three from both sides. That's how we need. That's how we need to move forward. That's the answer. Um, regarding the Democrat Party and racism, you know, they were the ones, that was the Democratic South. They were the ones that fought against freeing the slaves. They were the ones that assassinated um, Lincoln. They were the ones that unanimously voted against women having the right to vote. They were the ones that passed Jim Crow. You know, the Democrats, they realized, hey, we're not allowed to keep slaves legally. So what are we going to do? We're going to create the modern day plantation in every major American city. This is what we have now. I mean, look at it. They're like, we want to create a state of government dependence. And so they've tried to break apart the black nuclear family. And they've, you know, just created these areas, you know, with so much brokenness. And so, you know, we've got failing schools. We structure the welfare system to where you can make about $40,000 in tax-free benefits, which is just enough to where you're never going to launch a career at $38,000. And work is dignifying. And I will never incentivize somebody not to reach their God-given potential. And then we don't have adequate policing in some of these areas. Or there's police that are corrupt and they're not making good, good arrests that keep communities safe. Um, and then businesses are not attracted to invest in those areas. So we've got food deserts. And then we don't have public transportation. So you have to send your kid to a failing school. And then we take the choice away from parents and say, rather than giving you a voucher system, and having charter schools and private schools and saying, hey, here's your tax dollars. Mother, why don't you make the choice? Mom and dad, you know your kid best. Here's you know, all the tax dollars that, that you've contributed that would have gone to a public school education. You have the opportunity to take a voucher to anywhere and get your kid a great education that's going to fit them the best. So they've tried to break up the nuclear family. They've tried to take away you know, power from the parents in regard to their ability to parent their children. And we've just undermined, you know, the minority and especially the black community. And I mean, it's terrible. There was a lot that went wrong with Reconstruction. You know, we really should have gone into the South, you know, from the North and said, hey, we're going to have a little bit of a standing army here to make sure that, you know, we don't have some of these race problems that are taking place with lynchings and just other injustice issues taking place down there. And then also we've got to get some capital and resources into the hands of black families. So, for instance, land whatever else at the time would have been effective to help them launch to make up for lost time. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's terrible. A Abraham Lincoln, at the end of the Civil War, he said, he gave a speech and he basically said that every drop of blood of the 500,000 men and women that died on the battlefields of the Civil War was because of the lashes drawn on the backs of slaves. So he understood, he was a Christian, and he felt like this was God's way of dealing with the sin of slavery in America. And, you know, I, it, it breaks my heart to see minority communities not thriving because I want them to thrive. Seriously, they're wonderful. They're a beautiful part of God's heart. You know, I'm not racist because I think that God made every person on earth in his image. And the Bible says that he wants every tribe, nation, people, and tongue in heaven. So therefore, you know, I just see every person as, as made in God's image and I want to see them thrive. And uh, it's sick to see people get used and say, you're very convenient. I want your, you know, I need your vote every four years and that's it. And uh, don't vote for a Republican because you might lose a benefit. And so they scare them, they threaten them, they intimidate them every four years. And uh, I'm like, literally, if you know, the, the left claims systemic, race and systemic racism all over the place. And I'm like, what are you not in charge of? You're in charge of the education system. You're in charge of every major metropolitan area. You're in charge of the media. You're in charge of sports. What are they not in charge of? If they're claiming systemic racism, it's on them. So, yeah. This guy's impressive. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Mr. Bossert. Well, I actually have no more questions. Do we miss anything that that you wanted to, um, you know, say? No. Um, I never want to just say things because I have things to say. Mm -hmm. I only want to say things. Or you feel is yeah. important that... Mm, 
No, I mean, I will try to think of something, but I only want to say things that serve the listening audience. So a lot of people, just, they just spout facts. But I want to say, hey, what's going to serve the person I'm talking to? I don't need to say smart things because I know about them. I just want to say, hey, what's going to serve people? Um, you know, I'll just, I mean, I'll say this. The, the slogan that I came up with for my campaign is restoring the foundations and fighting for the future. And so the foundation is the most important part of any structure that you build, whether it be a building or an organization. And the foundation of our country is, you know, our founding documents, our constitution, and our history. And so, you know, the left and our, our current leaders, they have a, a living interpretation of the Constitution. They think it's a living document and that it can be interpreted with situational ethics, you know, regarding current situations and make it say something different. That's, that's not how it was meant to be interpreted. It's got, I'm an originalist, and it's got a meeting that with, you know, context that affects you know, all future it's generations. It's a written document, yeah. and it says what it says, and it doesn't say yeah. what it doesn't say. Exactly. Anthony Scalia. So, yeah. <laughs> Anthony Scalia. <laughs> so, I think you're very impressive. Okay. Thank you. Um, with that said, because uh, I was I was thinking maybe your 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 age was mm. a detriment. Yeah, and, yeah. The, and the time you spent in Nevada. Yeah. But after, after hearing you speak and, and, and talking about these different issues, you know, I, I think that um, you have a lot going for you. And, um, and if people would just stop what they're doing and, and take the time and, and watch this podcast yeah. of, of your interview, I think that they'll understand what I'm trying to relay. And um, with that said, um, what are the boundary lines for the people that's actually going to vote for you mm -hmm. to put you in the position of Congress so you can make all these yeah. extraordinary yeah. Um, 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 items that you're talking about? What, 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 what are the boundary lines? Because that, that's, yeah. you have to move out of CD3, get the votes before you could get on yeah. that plane and fly to Congress, right? Yeah. Well, the like so geographically the boundary lines. Sure. So it would be, and you know, with that with that yeah. said, well, what is it now? Because I I've heard they talk that they're going to re probably redistrict in in this month. Is it October yet, mm -hmm. or sometime in December? So yeah. what what is it right now? So right now, if you were to take Russell Road just north of the airport and then cut that all the way across the valley, and then take everything south, so all of Enterprise, all of Anthem, Henderson. Uh, Silverado Ranch, Boulder City, you know, down to the tip of the state. That's so all goes, CD3. It goes all the way down to um, Laughlin? Yeah. So everything, the whole tip of the state. So Russell Road by the airport, everything south, plus Summerlin. It kind of sweeps up around there. Okay. So if you're in that area, you can vote for me, and I would, I would appreciate that. I'd like to earn your vote. Um, and if you don't, you know, we're still probably fighting for the same thing. So if anything that I've said has resonated, you know, your support in terms of capital resources, making a donation or relational capital, you know, is super valuable to me. So you probably know a thousand people that I don't know. And if you share this on your Facebook, that's huge to me. You know, money is just spent to buy cap, you know, relational capital to make more impressions in the minds of people. So what's the population? It's about 700,000 roughly. And you can't knock on all those stories and probably half yeah. of that is what Republican maybe. Yeah, or, I think or, probably or, a little more than half. And of course, 700,000 is uh you know, that's the total population, including, you know, children who right. can't vote. Um, so when you really break it down, it really comes down to maybe, you know, 60 to 80,000 folks that I really need to engage with mm -hmm. in the primary. And those are registered Republicans that vote. And there's some people that are Republicans and they don't vote or they do vote and they're not Republicans. So there's really maybe a core target audience of 60 to 80,000 people. And then, of course, you only need to win 51% of that to win a primary. And then after that, in the general election, it's kind of a whole different race because then you need to, you know, engage with with uh, Democrats and, and everybody. But at the same time, in the primary, you could convince independents yeah. and libertarians and Democrats to yeah. switch parties yeah. to vote for you in the primary, and then when they get back to the general, they could switch back. Sure, I have I, I've that, seen but... that happen all the time. Okay, to get somebody out of a primary. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, if you could convince them to yeah. do that. And yeah, I mean, maybe I'll try. And I hope that I can convince people saying like, hey, this is just, this is who I am. Um, What's the average um, household there in CD3? 
In terms of income? Income. I think it's 55.5. Uh, I, I could be wrong. I might have changed a little bit. Um, 55,000? Yeah. What about... Um, it, it seems a little low. I think, you know, Summerlin, I think there's some areas that have more, but... Uh, I think because it includes the whole southern tip. I think uh, I think you're you're about right. I okay. uh, the store that I work at is in CD three. I don't okay. live in CD three, but yeah. yeah, you're probably about right on that. What about um, um, education? What do I want to do there? No, no, no. As far as uh, uh, CD three, what's the average education? Oh. Is high school, college? You know, I don't know. Vegas is very blue collar overall. I think it's uh, I think it's maybe about sixty percent, you know, bachelor's degree or some college. I think they kind of lump them together. Okay. So maybe an associates. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And as far as redistricting, I'm fine. However, they want to redistrict it. I think I'd be competitive. If you want to throw in UNLV, take it farther north. Please do. You know, I love those people. And right after this, I'm going to Bossa Nova Apartments on Flamingo, right across from Blueberry Hill, or sorry, on Tropicana. You got a team? Um, do I have a team? Yeah. I have a lot of different teams for different things that I do. So there's that's where a lot of the refugee community is. So I've got to go move a storage unit after this. Um, but, you know, I've been in Mulaski Park for years. I've just done stuff all over the city because it's what I like to do. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm probably involved with, you know, at least 10 different, um, you know, organizations, Christian or non-Christian, that are just trying to address needs in our community. Okay. Well, Mr. Bozart, um, thank you so much for coming on the program. Yeah, thank you. It's been inspiring and enlightening. Uh, if you can, um, um, look at the camera yeah. and tell folks why they should go to the, the, the voting booth and, and, and put you in office yeah. and your point of contact. Sure. Well, again, my name is Clark Bossert and uh, really enjoyed being on the show. I love CD3. I love America. I love freedom. I love Nevada and I want to fight for all of you. And right now, you don't have any avenue. Um, you know, the people of CD3 are devoid of an opportunity to enact substantive reform in Congress. You know, how are you going to do it? It's not coming through Susie Lee, and there's no Republican candidate that's competitive enough or principled enough to win and then make a change. And so I would like to be a representative. And my number right here on the card, this will be on the website, is 702-660-8885. Again, that's 702 660 8885. And the slogan is restoring the foundations, fighting for the future. We need the Constitution. We need our history. We can't stand to have it revised. And the foundations of public trust are being broken. You know, nobody trusts our institutions anymore. That's got to change. Trust is earned, and it's the job of government to earn it back because they've lost it. And then as far as fighting for the future, you know, it's as plain as saying, if we don't fight, we're going to lose it. So this is why I couldn't sit on the sidelines for another election cycle, and I felt like I had to jump in. So Anyways, God bless you. Thank you for watching. Please feel free to reach out to me. The email, if you'd like to reach out, is info at clarkbossert.com. And then the website is clarkbossert.com. I've got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Please follow me, and I'm easy to find. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Folks, that's Clark Bossert. He's a congressional candidate for Nevada's uh, District Number 3. This is Steve Sanson, Jim Jonas with Veterans in Politics. Until next time.